Hi, yeah, so um, my name is Peter Marshall. I work on the V8 team at Google. I've been there about two years. Uh, we're based out of Munich, so most of the V8 team is there. You can find me as Hooray Buffer on the Twitters. I don't tweet very much, but you, know, you can follow me. You can also follow V8JS, which is where the actual information comes from. Um, I'm gonna be talking about Orinoco, which is the code name for basically all of the garbage collector work that's happened in V8 um, over the last, say, five years. Um, yeah, this is our new logo. We like to have logos for every single component of V8. I don't know why, but I have stickers for all of this, so come and see me. You can have some stickers. I just wanna start off by saying that most JavaScript is garbage. <laughs> by that, I mean that you allocate a lot of memory every time you create an object, and uh, you don't have unlimited memory on your computer, and so V8 recycles this memory for you. This is the basic concept of garbage collection. And so I did a bit of searching, I did a bit of research for this talk to find out, yeah, what information was out there about the V8 garbage collector and what the perceptions of it were. And um, I'm gonna say perceptions are generally negative. Uh, here's a question I found on Stack Overflow from 2011, and it says, um, it goes like this, here's what I've read so far, correct me if I'm wrong. Node.js is based on the V8 JavaScript engine, that's true. V8 JavaScript engine implements stop the world garbage collection, that was true in 2011. Uh, which causes Node to sometimes completely shut down for a few seconds to a few minutes to handle garbage collection. You know, if this is running in production code, how is this acceptable? This is gonna, you know, totally ruin your experience for all your users. Okay, so I think perceptions look something like this. Perceptions are bad. Um, the great thing about garbage collection is there's so many GIFs that I can use. Um, so the Orinoco project has been working uh, is basically all the work done over the last five to six years um, to yeah, bring the V8 garbage collector up to speed. So it, the garbage collector no longer looks like this, I promise you. It looks more like this. <laughs> <laughs> Distractingly good gifts, okay. So I think that covers the motivation, but also I just wanna make this explicit. So if you're running your node server, then um, why would you care about garbage collection? Um, you know, if garbage collection took a really long time and blocked the main thread for ages, this would cause long pauses for your requests, for your users. You know, this would block the event loop from doing anything because you're still stuck in this JavaScript, right? Um, if you're running Chrome, uh, which also embeds V8, then you're actually gonna see user visible jank. So this is, a user is actually gonna interact with your page and it could be that if the garbage collection pauses the whole main thread, then they're gonna actually see that in their interaction. So if you're aiming for 60 frames a second, then you have 16 milliseconds to actually paint each frame. Um, if your garbage collection takes more than 16 milliseconds, then you've missed that frame, right, by definition. Here's a demo from um, an online thing called Ort Online from a few years ago. And this is just comparing two different uh, versions of Chrome, Chrome 41 and 46. It's now Chrome 70, so it's even better than this. You can see the left-hand side, you can actually see this visible stutter, and those are actually garbage collection pauses in Chrome 41. Um, so some of them are even a few hundred milliseconds here. You notice it gets quite far behind because it does actually wait to render every frame. It doesn't skip frames. Um, so the right-hand side is actually going much faster. And yeah, this is just to prove that garbage collection is something that's important. Users actually see this as not just a number on a graph, right? Uh, so I'm gonna talk about the garbage collector. I'm gonna talk about garbage collection in general, how it works, go through some of the algorithms, and then talk about how it works in V8 today. Um, just a brief reminder, uh, you have the stack, which is your static locals and sort of execution for your program, and then you have the heap. And garbage collection concerns itself with the heap, so we're worried about dynamically allocated objects. In terms of JavaScript, this is basically everything. This is arrays, functions, objects, everything you can think of. Um, and we split our heap into pages of size 512 kilobytes. This is just so we have sort of a useful level at which we can do all this concurrent work, which I'll talk about later. So I think the perceptions of garbage collection are something like this. You have your main thread, and then the GC is gonna kick in at some point, um, and it's gonna do all this work, and it's gonna take some huge amount of time, right? So the reality in 2011 was something more like this. You do have, yeah, a stop the world garbage collection, as they call it, um, and for a particularly bad one, it could take something like a few hundred milliseconds. Um, there's a certain amount of work that a garbage collector just has to do. We can't make it take zero time, right? A garbage collector essentially has to find all of the live objects, like figure out which ones are live and dead. It has to reclaim the memory somehow, make it available to actually be recycled. 
Um, and then optionally, you can also do some sort of defragmentation, compaction uh, in order to save space. So I'm gonna dive into each of these steps and explain how that exact algorithm works. Um, this is how it works in V8, but it's also just as a general concept. So to actually find the garbage to differentiate live objects from dead ones, um, the other algorithm is called marking, and it goes like this. You start at a set of known root pointers, so like the stack and the global object and a few other things in JavaScript, and you follow all of these pointers or references to every other object in the heap. And as you reach each object, you mark that object, and you say this object is reachable from the current execution state, and that means that it's live, according to our analysis. So we can't delete it because somebody might use it later. Um, and everything left over is then garbage implicitly. So we only find the live objects, and everything we didn't find is then garbage. Um, this is cool because you pay a cost relative to the number of objects which survive, not the number of objects which you actually allocate. And we'll see why that's important. Just visually, it looks like this. You have your stack and your global object. You follow all of these references. You go into the heap pages. Each object you find here is marked yellow, uh, and in mean, this diagram anyway. And then the blue is like all of the objects which were allocated, which we didn't find during this marking step. So these are unreachable and then implicitly dead. The V8 heap is actually split into a generational heap layout. It's worth knowing this. So uh, we have a young generation and an old generation, and we actually have three different ages of objects. So when you first allocate an object, it's gonna go into what's called the nursery. Um, and this is in the young generation. And then if it survives one GC, uh, we move that object, and we actually call that now uh, an intermediate object. And then if it survives another GC, then we move it into the old generation. Um, it's also worth knowing V8 actually has two garbage collectors, and they're basically independent. So you have uh, what's called a minor GC, also called a scavenger. Um, and this deals with the young generation exclusively. And then you also have a major GC, full mark, compact, mark sweep, and this deals with the whole heap at once. So we'll look into how the scavenger works exactly. So once we've done our marking phase, so pretend these arrows coming in the left are all our references from the stack and the global object, then we know, okay, we're in the nursery and these are the live objects we're gonna deal with, right? Um, the first thing we do is we switch the labels here and we call this from space and to space. Um, and then, for all of the objects that survive, we actually evacuate these into two space. Um, and this basically means we copy all of these objects, we just literally copy the bytes from them, uh, and we move them into two space. This is called the evacuation step. When we do this, we put this little mark on them, that's the little circle in two space, and that just means we've moved this object once, so now it's intermediate, right? Um, okay, so now we have this block which was from space, and all of our live objects have moved, everything else in there was implicitly dead, so now that whole block is free again, right? Um, the only problem here is you'll notice the pointers now point to the wrong thing, because they point into from space. So we need to update all these references, so all of the objects that reference these live objects, we now go back and change all these pointers so they point to the right place. We then switch the two spaces around, and the two space becomes the nursery again. So we always allocate into the same space here in the nursery. Um, so if we were to do another allocation, that would just go underneath this one in the nursery now. Um, uh, obviously, we keep doing this, the nursery is going to get really full, right? Which is why we move things through the generation. So the next GC would look like this. If these four objects on top survived, we would then put these into the old generation. We know to do that because of this little mark we put on them. Um, and then that newly allocated one is going to go to two space, and it continues like this. The objects that survive will move through the generations. The objects that die just disappear and get written over by the next allocation. So the key points of the minor GC, the scavenge, are that after one GC, we move the object to intermediate. After the second, it goes to old space, uh, the old generation. Um, the new space is always half empty or half full, so one thing about moving everything and then switching the two spaces is you always have to have one totally empty space because you might need to move everything, right? Um, and don't forget to update the references to all of those objects because if you forget to do that, then you know, your VM is gonna crash in weird and wonderful ways that are hard to debug. So why does the V8 heap layout look like this? It's pretty complicated. We could just have one giant blob. So in GC, there's this thing called the generational hypothesis. And this basically says that most objects die young. Um, and this is just a property that's true in a lot of dynamic languages like PHP, Java, Python. This is generally true that most objects, they get allocated, something happens with them briefly maybe, and then they disappear almost immediately. And then the small percentage that don't tend to live for a long time. So the generational heap layout is sort of designed to take advantage of this fact. 
And one cool thing about the way the generational heap layout works is that you do work relative to the number of objects which survive. So we only copy objects that survive. Copying them is kind of expensive, um, but we only copy the ones that survive, which according to this hypothesis are uh, only a few objects. I mean, the flip side of this is that it would make long-living objects really expensive. So if you allocate a whole bunch of objects and they survive for a very long time, then we're gonna copy them from the uh, nursery into intermediate, and then we're gonna copy them into old space again, so why would you copy every object this many times? Um, well, we actually have optimizations that deal with this as well, so even for this few percentage of objects that do survive all the time, we have this thing called pre-tenuring, where we can allocate them straight into the old space if they always end up there anyway. So there's always ways to get around this. So I promised there were two types of GCs. So the second one is the full mark compact. This is the one which takes more time, it deals with the whole heap, um, not just the new space. Um, and so we do a slightly different thing here, so we don't always compact every page in the old space. Uh, the first thing we would do is we would just find the gaps where these objects uh, aren't reachable, and we take that space and we put it on what's called a free list. And this is basically just a, a list which is separated by size, and it says, here's a free chunk of this size. And then when you want to allocate into old space, you can just find a chunk that fits the object you want to put in there. Um, we do still do some compaction in old space, but we don't compact every page because, uh, yeah, that would take a lot of time. So, but we have a heuristic which tells us which pages are getting fragmented, and then we can copy those pages specifically. Um, so the key things here with sweeping are the implicitly dead memory gets added to a free list, and uh, we allocate using that free list when we move things into the old generation later. You can think of this basically like, uh, with the defragmenting, basically like on an old Windows machine. It's a pretty good analogy for it. You're just saving space by moving things together, and yeah. Um, so we move surviving objects. It's a key thing about the GC is it's a moving GC. Uh, it goes back and updates all the references to those things um, so that they point to the new location. Scavengers always compact by evacuating things, and major GCs only compact fragmented pages according to some heuristic. So that's how GC works in general, but uh, what about Orinoco? So the Orinoco effort was basically to take the GC that existed, which was basically purely sequential, and turn it into um, a more modern garbage collector with mostly concurrent and parallel garbage collection with an incremental backup. And the whole goal of this is to free the main thread of garbage collection work because we wanna get on running your JavaScript, not moving objects around. So there's a bit of terminology there which we need to unpack, and particularly I think a lot of people use parallel and concurrent interchangeably, but for GC, um, there's an important difference that we'll talk about, and then incremental, I also didn't know what that was, so uh, we'll talk about that as well. So parallel is probably the easiest way to move some work off the main thread. Um, this is where your main thread and your helper threads do some work at the same time, um, so they split one task up, and you get a bunch of helper threads, and you all pitch in to do the same work at the same time. You can still think of this as stop the world garbage collection because we still have this main thread pause. We're still not running any JavaScript, right? But if you have n threads, then uh, you divide the work by n, right? So there's a little bit of overhead that you have to do with synchronization between the threads, so it won't be exactly a factor of n, but you move some work off the main thread, right? You reduce this pause time. Incremental in terms of our GC is where we take an amount of garbage collection work that has to be done and we split it into little pieces and we sort of sprinkle it in between the JavaScript. Um, and each one of these GC things here is not an individual whole garbage collection, it's a small amount of work you would need to do, so maybe some of the marking work of finding the live objects. Um, the difficult thing here is that obviously you're running JavaScript in between these phases and you're actually invalidating assumptions or you're invalidating work that you did previously. So if you found an object and you marked it as live, and then you run some GC, the whole heap has changed. So maybe there are new live objects or maybe there are some that have changed. So you always have to do this fix up step and there's techniques to do that, but it's just more complicated than just stopping the world and doing it all at once, right? The goal of this is to get better main thread latency. So you notice we don't actually shrink the amount of work we have to do. We still do the same amount of GC and the same amount of JS, but if you're animating frames or doing something like that, at least the JavaScript can keep giving you results while you're doing your GC, so it sort of interleaves it. And the third and most difficult one here is actually fully concurrent. And by this we mean JavaScript keeps running on the main thread. Um, and this is the best from the JavaScript developer's point of view. Yeah, the GC doesn't even interrupt me, I don't have any main thread pause time. Um, so it's great if we can do as much work concurrently as possible. So this is where main thread is still running JavaScript, you have helpers which are doing some amount of work, um, 
and they're doing this totally concurrent to the main thread. Um, the disadvantage here is obviously there's a lot more synchronization that happens. So with incremental, you have to look at the world and say, did anything change since the last time I did some GC work? Um, with concurrent, the main thread and the helper threads are accessing the same objects at the same time, um, so you need a lot of synchronization and stuff going on here to make sure that you don't mess this up. Um, here's some more GIFs. Uh, this is a GIF of an actual V8 team member working on Orinoco. I had a terrible day. I don't know what happened. So the reality of garbage collection uh, a few, like many years ago in V8 was something like this. We had this stop the world pause, but what does it look like today? So we do scavenging in parallel. Um, we use up to seven helper threads, so the main thread and seven helper threads would split the work into eight parts. We kick off all these threads at the same time. Um, and we do evacuation um, and marking. So in, in scavenging, we actually interleave all of these phases at the same time. So we do uh, the marking, the evacuation, and the pointer updating all at the same time, uh, which is why we do it in parallel. And um, you would be looking at roughly a five millisecond main thread pause time for this minor GC, uh, for the, for the pa uh, parallel scavenge, rather. In case you don't believe me, I took a Chrome trace on my laptop, uh, on my workstation actually, from loadingfacebook.com. There's a lot of detail in this, but basically you can see there's eight different threads running. The main thread is at the top. Um, so we do have this uh, actual main thread pause still, but then we split work out to each of the worker threads. They all run some amount of work. Um, if one of them finishes early, it will take a task from another thread and finish that one. So they all finish roughly the same time, um, and then the main thread can continue. So this is how we do scavenging in V8 today, and this took 2.7 milliseconds on Facebook. This is just a random sample I took. Um, for the major GC, it has a lot more work to do. It's dealing with a lot more pages. It's doing the young generation and the old generation. Um, so there's actually a lot going on here. So let's break it down a bit. We do concurrent marking, and we do this before we actually start the GC. So remember, the marking is the bit where you're tracing the pointers, finding the live objects. And we can do this while JavaScript is running. Uh, we just have to make sure that any new objects that get created and linked into the whole heap object graph uh, get recorded as well. So we do this as we're approaching a heap limit. So as we know, okay, we're gonna kick off a GC soon, then we'll kick off these uh, concurrent marking tasks in the background. Then the main thread pause time starts, and this is where we do compaction and updating. So remember, some pages in old space get compacted, depending if they're particularly fragmented or not. Um, so we would start compacting those pages in parallel, kind of similar to what the scavenger does, and then we do all the pointer updates as well. Um, this is the part we can't really do concurrently, which is why we have to do it in parallel with the main thread. While we're doing that, we also kick off concurrent sweeping tasks. So remember, the sweeping is the one which finds all the empty holes in the uh, old space pages and puts them on a free list. Um, and we can do this on the background. Um, so as long as we have synchronization on this free list that we're putting the things into, then uh, we can do this totally in the background. So we kick that off at the same time, and these keep running once your JavaScript starts again. Um, and from the point of view of V8, this is pretty much almost ideal. There's still some work in the main thread that we have to do there, um, but as much as we can get off onto separate threads without too much overhead, we can do that. And we can actually run it while your JavaScript is running. So you can see the major GC looks a little bit more complicated. On the left-hand side, you see all those tasks which kick off, and those are the background marking tasks. Um, there's actually a lot of marking work going on because this is, these are about 15 milliseconds each, um, and there's seven threads running. So it's actually a lot of work that would have happened on the main thread. Um, then we have the full uh, GC pause in the middle, and so the main thread actually pauses here. We kick off all those parallel uh, compaction tasks, and then you see on the right-hand side that once the main GC is done, we kick off these background sweeping tasks that keep running. Um, so we actually managed to reduce the main thread pause quite a lot just by moving these things out into concurrent tasks, and this takes roughly 9.8 milliseconds on my workstation for a major GC. So how do we actually trigger a GC? Because I've talked about how the mechanics of it work, but yeah, what, what actually triggers this? So for a new space, for a scavenge, um, we trigger a GC when we run out of space in new space. It's that simple. Like we have one big block we allocate into. When we run out of space, we kick off a scavenge, and then that's going to get us a bunch more space um, because we're going to move stuff into the old generation, most probably. Um, for old space, there are a bunch of triggers. It gets kind of complicated. But basically, the heap starts off small, and we grow the size of the heap as the app runs. 
um, and we try and sort of estimate a sweet spot between CPU usage, GC work, um, and yeah, your actual application and the amount of memory you use. It's always a trade-off between these things, right? Um, we do this by looking at the allocation rate, so how often you're allocating objects, um, the size of the objects. We look at the survival rate, so what percentage is actually getting promoted into the old generation eventually, um, and we dynamically compute a limit for the next GC. Um, so, yeah, you can think of it that the GC is like your best friend, really. I mean, the GC is constantly watching your app and trying to find the best limit for you, and you know, if you use a lot of memory and then you suddenly don't use very much memory anymore, the GC is gonna pick up on that and reduce the limit, so, um, yeah, best friend. The other question I get sometimes is uh, some variation of this, which is, can I have a GC switch? Like, I just want a big button that I want to hit, and it's going to cause a garbage collection, because so far, everything I've told you, you know, you don't have any control over that. The GC just runs when V8 says it does. Um, the short answer is no, you can't have a GC switch. Um, there are a bunch of reasons for this. Uh, it's not part of the JavaScript language, so I think it would have to go through the specification in some way. Um, but it's also not particularly specifiable. So different engines have totally different implementations of GC. You couldn't actually rely on this GC button to do anything. Um, so it's not very generalizable. It would also affect V8's heuristics because as I said, as I said we uh, look at the previous GCs and try and compute this limit. So if you put artificial GCs in there, this will totally throw off this algorithm. Um, but we do actually have a mechanism kind of for doing this, and this is called idle tasks. So embedders like Node and Chrome um, if you actually embed V8 in your app, have a mechanism to trigger GC sort of cooperatively with V8. Um, and it works something like this. So uh, take Chrome, for example. If you have a Chrome tab and it's doing some animation, you know you have a certain amount of time to hit that animation frame, right? 16 milliseconds. Um, if you've done 10 milliseconds of work and your animation frame is ready, then you're like, hey, I have six milliseconds to spare. We could do some GC. Um, but rather than force V8 to do a GC, the way this works is the GC will post an idle task. And this is work that the GC would have done anyway, so it'll be like incremental marking or parallel scavenging. So it's work that would have happened later, but the GC gives you an option to run this work earlier. Um, so you as the embedder can say, do you have any idle tasks? Let's run them. I'll give you a one millisecond budget or something like that. Come back to me and tell me how much work is left and what we have left to do. Um, and this is a bit more cooperative than a GC now button. Um, you can actually put a little time limit on it and say just do a little bit of work. Um, but the key thing is that it's a totally optional task. So the GC doesn't have to post tasks and the embedder doesn't have to accept tasks. It will work totally without this. Um, what's interesting to note is this is not used in Node currently. So we had an older mechanism um, which wasn't as cooperative and it turned out this was kind of bad for Node's performance. Um, so it used to be a Node and it's not anymore, but I know a few collaborators who are interested in adding this back into Node. So maybe it will come to a node near you soon, if it's a good thing for performance. Um, so the takeaways that I want you to get from this talk are that don't see the fear the GC, it wants to be your friend. Um, there's a lot of work going on on the GC at the moment, um, and while Chrome and Node.js are sort of very different use cases in terms of the objects they're allocating and where the performance needs to be, um, the GC is trying to be very general to both these use cases and others as well. So Orinoco has moved a lot of the work that happened in that big main thread pause uh, off thread into parallel, incremental, and concurrent tasks. Um, it's worth noting as well, like most developers don't really need to think about the GC that often. Hopefully you're writing node code, you're deploying it, you know, you're looking at your profiles and everything like that, and you're not seeing any big GC issues. Um, but there are patterns you can follow that work well with pretty much all garbage collected languages and not just JavaScript. And this comes down to these things like the generational hypothesis and uh, generational heap layouts. So you, we know from that that short-lived objects are actually very cheap in V8, and in a lot of managed languages, they work this way. Um, so if you allocate an object, it dies straight away. We're never going to promote that through our generational scheme. It's just going to sit in from space, and then it's going to get implicitly collected. This is actually very cheap from the point of view of the V8 GC. So as long as you're not doing things like, you know, attaching everything to the global object or leaking a lot through context and this kind of thing, just following general uh, memory-safe behavior, then, yeah, don't be afraid of allocating short-lived objects. Our GC basically doesn't care about them. Um, yeah, so hopefully you learned a bit from that. I have a bunch of stickers of every V8 thing we've ever made a sticker for. Um, you can follow me on V8.js and uh, at Hooray Buffer as well on Twitter. Um, yeah, come talk to me if you have any GC questions, just want to talk about V8. That'd be great. Thank you.